are you following all this stuff about how uncertainty is really taking a beating and people are saying that it isn't this mysterious property of nature, it's a mysterious property of Swedish quantum physicists and that the, um, David Bohm's formulation of the quanta is a much more elegant formulation and gives you, eliminates the uncertainty domain at the cost of introducing non-locality, which because of Bell's theorem, they're uh, practically ready to admit. So there is this sort of wild horse movement in quantum physics to make it completely explicit and predictable and uh, get rid of all the woo-woo that comes in with the, the Niels Bohr formulation. I wasn't thinking so much of the uncertainty principle that, uh, um, for example, time can reverse. There's nothing at the subatomic particle level that constrains time one way or the other, as far as I know. Uh, and, and so lots of things can happen, and yet there are certain habits that have evolved in the universe, which we call the laws of physics, or, the, um, or the, actually the symmetry principles. Right. And it seems to me that it, it would have to be that way. If that's what's happening at the nature level, it, it, it's reflecting something that's happening at a deeper level. Well, you came in late, but part of what we were talking about was Prigozhin and some of his new work. And one of the things he casts doubt on or is very skeptical of is the irreversibility principle. He says that, well, first of all, he says time is, an act, is a process. It's not a concept. And that there is an arrow, which is good news for my position because I've always felt that, that there was an arrow. Is there order in the disorder? I mean, I'm hearing you say order. I'm hearing you say disorder. Is there an order to the chaos? Enough to, to create it as predictable? Chaos is the mother of order. So it, is, it, is, it is a system, then. It is, in a sense, its own law. Well, yeah, uh, one of the things that I have down here to cover, but we haven't sort of steered near it, but that does it, is if we go... I mean, for a scientist, here's the real difference between what freedom and law means and what novelty and habit means. The way science has been done since Newton is through probability theory. You get this with Cantor and these people. Probability theory it is a very, very necessary tool for science, but it may be a bogus assumption about nature. Let's think about probability theory for a moment. Um, here's how it works. You want to know how much electricity is flowing through a wire. You measure, you carry out a thousand measurements. You add them together. You divide by a thousand. You now say, this is how much electricity is flowing through the line. Well, but it's entirely possible. But if you look back through the thousand measurements you made, not one will be the same as this average value which you're now holding up and saying is how much electricity is flowing through the line. Not one of your measurements confirms your final conclusion. But people say, well, but uh, you know, induction and accumulation of sample and averaging averaging is what's going on here at the center and the key to using averaging with intellectual effectiveness is you're making an assumption that's very deep and the assumption you're making is that time is invariant well that is simply an assumption um, it is the centrally untested assumption of science over the past 500 years. Now, let's take something really important. I agree. I'm making with you to say that this is the amount of electricity that's flowing through at this particular point in time. Well, but we, the yeah. whole notion of science is not that we attain states of intellectual consensus, but that we have a true reflection of the phenomenon. So then here's a case where this becomes more important, the speed of light. The speed of light in, in uh, the general and special theory of relativity is specified to be a constant. So, since 1908, the speed of light has been measured uh, uh, on, on this one planet. 
with various devices. Not once has any device ever gotten a value exactly congruent with any other device. Never. Well, so then they rush forward, you know, very uh, flustered that you would even mention this embarrassment. And they say, well, you don't understand. It's the limit of the instrumentality. Well, but wait a minute. This is just a phrase some weasel lawyer scientist put together <laughs> to explain why they weren't getting the right value. Because they're saying, okay, we're measuring the speed of light. Now, we're within 30 meters per second of where it was yesterday. Or this measurement is only off by 20 meters per second, one part in billions. But the point is, you're not getting the same measurement that you got yesterday. And so why are you saying that the speed of light is constant? Well, because the entire theory of relativity falls to pieces if you ever yield on that principle. and. Uh, so then uh, a, a person who was trying to do what in science is called save the phenomenon would say, well, let's, let's plot the, the speed of light and see how much it's varying. Well, now, if it is in fact what is called the limit of the instrumentality that is causing this problem, then do we all agree that the values should cluster around uh, mean. In other words, this guy is 30 meters too fast, this guy in Australia, he gets 30 meters too slow, this person is 70 meters too fast, right? The values would cluster, right? But what do we actually see when we examine these variations in the speed of light? We see that from 1908 until 1975, and I'll explain why, 1975, from 1908 to 1975, the speed of light has apparently slightly increased. The values are not staying constant. They're drifting slightly upward. Well, we are on one tiny planet in one very narrow slice of time, and yet we, having measured the speed of light to be sliding slowly toward faster and faster, have created a physics based on the assumption that it's a universal constant and never changes. Weird completely in contravention to the stated methods of science. Well, then what happens in 1972? They hold a conference in Geneva, and everybody lays their cards out on the table, and they say, look, this is just a pain, this whole business about the speed of light. From now on, the International Geophysical Union will define the speed of light. And nobody should go and measure it. Don't do that. If you want to know the speed of light, flip open your handbook of physical constants. And we, the International Physical Union, have decreed that this is the speed of light. Weird. And, you know, we could go on with similar examples. Melting points. When a compound is created or isolated from nature that has never been created before, one of the first things you do with it is you, as a physical chemist, you determine its melting point. This then goes into a handbook that's published around the world of melting points. Well, the apparatus for doing melting point uh, measurements hasn't changed greatly in a hundred years. Melting points for certain compounds have fluctuated three degrees centigrade. We're not talking thousands of a degree here. We're talking about all over the map kind of stuff. Rupert studied this. You know, got a complete set of the 20th century's published melting points. And, you know, what is chromium dioxide? What did it melt at in 1934? What did it melt at in 1958? And looked at this, made charts showing many melting points rising with the measurements over time, took it to the editors of the, journal, of the publishing house that is in charge of all that. They, they were amazed. They hadn't a clue. It's a, a, a complete bafflement, unless you believe, you know, that it, these things are wavering and that everything is less, you know, not subject to eternal laws. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that speed of light is 
accelerating that these are all going up? I mean, everything seems to be increasing as does novelty in returns as we go towards this time. Yeah, I mean, it's slight. It's slight, but uh, very suggestive. Uh, And when you think about it, if you really believe in eternal laws of nature, then you just have a, 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 a philosophical mess on your hands. I mean, eternal laws of nature. The universe... The yeah, the universe is a finite thing. It burst into existence X billion years ago. Where are you going to say the laws of nature were before the universe existed? And don't forget, we're not only talking about laws of physics, that's one thing. What about the laws of gene segregation? Where were they before biology existed? What kind of a question is that to even ask? Clearly we're in a sort of a a, a loop here of ignorance. It's ignorance that generates questions that have no meaning, you know. And... uh, uh, so, so the universe is a thing where habit constrains, but novelty overcomes that constraint. And once overcome, new levels of novelty become incorporated into the old set of constraints. I mean, like, for instance, take Manhattan. Manhattan is an incredibly novel addition to the geography of southern New York. And yet... Once in place, it has its rules. You don't break them. If you break the rules, you'll be run over by a city bus or mugged or something. So novelty establishes new domains of, uh, of constraint. And then out of that constraint, new novelty emerges. And this is a principle which I believe, thanks to Prigozhin and others reaches across, all the way across the domain of phenomena. I mean, we're not just simply talking about what goes on in biology. We're talking about what goes on in uh, astrophysics, biology, cultural anthropology, sociology. Uh, These principles are uh, universal. And this is something new. This is something new in the 20th century, in, in, and it's been a hard battle. I mean, uh, you know, the theory of evolution is essentially a theory which is an effort to account for the large numbers of diverse plants and animals on the planet. Darwin, in his diaries, referred to what he was doing as searching for a solution to the species problem. Uh, It it was not thought to have anything to do with sociology or geology. But now, I think we can see, if we are willing to accept that the universe is an organism rather than a machine, which is what we inherit out of Descartes and Newton, if we can see that the universe is an organism, then we can uh, see that it is evolving across all spectrums of phenomena. I mean, stars evolve, societies evolve, uh, personalities, communities, um, tectonic systems. Everything seeks higher states of order. This is the Prigozhin principle, that systems actually seek higher states of order. This is, he and and Manfred Eigen and that crowd coined the phrase dissipative structure. Dissipative structures are these special situations which arise in nature where order is actually preserved far from equilibrium. That's the technical way of saying it. In other words, equilibrium is where you get to when you let go and then you drift toward death, disintegration, decay, equilibrium. And sooner or later, in the old paradigm, all systems will reach equilibrium. A cup of coffee left standing becomes a cold cup of coffee. Uh, Everything seeks equilibrium. But what Prigozhin showed was that some systems don't and that they are incredibly tenacious life being the most obvious example how does it do it how does life perform this trick 
of uh, maintaining itself homeostatically far from equilibrium. Well, it does it through the process of transferring order in the environment into its uh, energy cycle and then passing disorder out of the system. This is what we call eating and excreting. You take in high, uh, very highly ordered proteins with a lot of energy bound into carbohydrate and protein. You extract energy from that and excrete out a m much less differentiated, much less energy intensive material. And by cycling energy through the form, the morphogenetic form of the body maintains itself. It's a kind of miracle. I mean, the, the form is like a ghost in matter. The matter flows through it, and the form puts the matter through a series of contortions that allow the form to exist. And as long as the form, the organismic form, can obtain high-grade stuff, which it can get energy out of, it will maintain itself far from equilibrium. And through the miracle of genetics and heredity, this maintenance of a state far from equilibrium has been going on on this planet for several billion years. And of course, mind emerges out of this. Mind is a phenomenon of metabolic activity. Where, as so far as we know, where there is not metabolism, there is not consciousness. Even computers, they have to have a flow of electrons in their guts. When there's no electrons flowing, there's no, there's no computation taking place. Similarly for us, when there is no flow of electrons, no charge transfer, then you're dead. You know, and there's no coming back from that. But if you have had children, look what's happened. Half of your information has been kept uh, alive in the non-equilibrium thermodynamic state of the dissipative structure, which is the species, you see.